My name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm the executive director of our Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship at Case Western Reserve University. I also teach in our business school, um, and I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Robbie Bach um, to our speaker series. Um, I'll tell a quick story of how we know each other, and it was funny, like in the world of LinkedIn and networking, we sort of refound each other recently. I, um, when I was an MBA at Wharton, I um, had the pleasure of interning in Robbie's group. It was then the Internet Gaming Zone, gamer, <laughs> free Xbox. So I worked for Michael Mott and Ed Freeze and folks that Robbie knows well. And um, it was when, and the Microsoft interview process is quite interesting in that you, um, you go through your interviews and only if you're doing well in the interview process, do you then get to meet the, the senior folks of the team. So I remember I did my interviews and then I came back to the HR folks and they're like, you've got one more interview. You're going to meet Robbie Bach. And uh, so I went to go meet him. And then he had to go pick up his son, Philip. Um, at the time, it was funny. We now, Philip and I are LinkedIn friends. I was like, he's a college graduate. I don't know what grade he was. This is 1998 or nine. So we got to hang out in the car, do, he was doing dad carpool pickup and we got to chat and it was awesome. And so when Robbie and I reconnected, I was like, where's your son now? So now he's like a grown up working at Accenture, college basketball player. So that's my memory of, of hanging out with you and in, in in the pickup. So it's great. It's great to reconnect. Uh, the, the internet gaming zone was the uh, very poor second cousin to what became Xbox Live. <laughs> well, it was a great summer. I enjoyed it. I, I, I love working with those guys. Um, I'm going to turn it over. For those that are new to this format, we always have a student um, moderate, which is great. And uh, we have Mohamed Saleh, who is one of our awesome CS students um, at home in an hour outside of Cairo, Egypt. So we're knocking on our technology wood here and that all Wi-Fi connections work well. But Mohamed, we're thrilled to have you moderate this session. Mohammed's also working as an intern this summer for another one of our alums named Arnold Huffman at Digital Yalo. So we are truly global um, in doing our internships and our sessions. So I will turn it over to Mohammed. Feel free to use the chat to let Mohammed know if you have questions. You can put the question in the chat. You can raise your hand. This will be really informal. If you're on Facebook Live, just put your question in on uh, Facebook and then we'll be monitoring and ask it. So with that, over to you, Mohammed. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very happy and thrilled to welcome Robbie on, on this chat. Um, like, I'm, I'm personally very curious to talk about all of his like impressive, successful career at Microsoft, being one of my favorite companies ever. And as a, as a tech enthusiast myself, it's going to be crazy to talk and, and learn about how Xbox came into life. So. Well, with no further ado, uh, I'll hand it to Robbie. And if you can start us by uh, telling us more about uh, how, how did you start at Microsoft and what was your education background? Yeah, so I went to uh, undergraduate school at the University of North Carolina. Uh, I was an econ major. I thought I wanted to um, uh, work in finance. I went to work on Wall Street at Morgan Stanley. Um, I discovered after about a year that finance was interesting, but didn't involve people enough and that I wanted to be a marketing person and a salesperson, not a finance person. I ultimately ended up going back to business school. I went to business school at Stanford and um, uh, got interviewed on campus by a guy from Microsoft named Pete Higgins, who is now my best friend. Um, Pete interviewed me on campus, came back to Microsoft for one of those interviews that Michael just mentioned where... If you did well, you got to meet the as appropriate interviewee and they uh, decided whether you got an offer from Microsoft. And I ended up working at Microsoft for a little over 22 years. Um, I spent, uh, started in marketing uh, on uh, some uh, flight simulator and Microsoft Works and a product called Learning DOS, which is not DOS itself, but we had to have a product to teach you how to use DOS. Um, then I was Microsoft's first expat to live overseas, so I moved to Paris, and I worked at the European headquarters for two years, then came back to run marketing for Excel, and then Microsoft Office for five and a half years and launched three versions of Office, and then took a complete right turn in my career and said, no, I want to get out of marketing, I want to get into general management, 
So I went to work for Pete Higgins, the same guy who had hired me originally. And uh, I ran a bunch of sort of consumer misfit toys that Microsoft had loosely collected over the years. One of which was Microsoft's gaming business, which consisted of Age of Empires, the Gaming Zone, and Flight Simulator. And um, in 1999, Microsoft decided to do Xbox. And through a bit of serendipity, um, that ended up being my business. And I was the chief Xbox officer, the first leader of that business, and ran it for 10 years until I left the company in 2010. Um, probably the most difficult 10 years of my professional career, but also the most rewarding. Uh, yeah. Since then, I've been uh, doing a lot of nonprofit board work. I'm on five nonprofit boards. Um, I do a little bit of for-profit board work, although I only have one for-profit board right now. Um, I'm a writer. I've written one book, working on a second book, and uh, I own a gluten-free pasta company. Um, so we, uh, we make gluten-free fresh pasta rolls and flour. Um, so I have sort of a portfolio of things that I'm doing right now. So that is the history of Robbie Bach in a nutshell, Mohammed. That's a very impressive uh, long history. Uh, you, you just mentioned that, that 10 years working for uh, work, uh, working as leader of Xbox were the most difficult yet rewarding years of your career at Microsoft. Why would you say that? Well, the Xbox project was, was super hard. We, you know, we started with 20 people. Um, Microsoft had never done real hardcore hard, uh, hardware development. Uh, we were about... 12 to 18 months behind Sony in developing our product. We only had 18 months to put the product together. And that first 18 months was really, really difficult. We didn't have a real strategy. Our strategy was sort of, okay, this is a mad sprint to the finish line. Whatever we have to do to ship the hardware on time is what we're going to do. And, you know, we that took the team in that time from 20 people to 2,000 people. Um, which is just a scary pace of growth. And it was super dysfunctional. And I wasn't a very disciplined leader at that point. Sort of didn't recognize early on the need for us to step back and do some strategy work and do some culture work and just stayed very focused on the task at hand. And so it was, um, you know, we shipped that first product on time. The product did fine in the marketplace, but we lost, depending on how you do the math, somewhere between five and seven billion dollars. Um, so it's hard to call that a success. Um, but from that, I learned a bunch. And then we started working on strategy. We got focused on building team culture. Um, Xbox 360, the second generation of the product, was wildly successful. And I, I learned a lot in that process. And uh, the second version was just as much work, but was way more enjoyable with a, uh, a team culture and a vibe that was um, way more sustainable. And, um, you know, so I, I got my own, I, I learned a ton in that 10 years, um, went through some real personal crises and some, some business crises in the process. Um, when I came out the other side, I sort of felt like, okay, wow, I had a second MBA. Um, and this time I actually learned this stuff. Um, and, uh, it was, it was super powerful. I, I love the way how you phrase, like how such hard time made you the person you are right now and how much you learned out of it. I think it, it's, uh, it's an important lesson for, for everybody, especially us younger people now who are starting this journey. Well, look, just to, just to reflect on that for a minute, um, it's, a, it's a very uh, difficult time right now, right? I mean, the economy is not great. Um, it's a world pandemic. Um, the United States has all kinds of problems um, on the racial front, on the economic front, on the healthcare front, and there's hugely challenging times. And my only comment to people who are going through that is, um, these times that test us also are the times that create opportunity. And if you're an entrepreneur, in many respects, if you have the resiliency to get through the difficult time right now, there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. There's more opportunity is going to come from these challenges than you can possibly imagine. 
Um, and as painful and as anxiety ridden as the time is, and as, as, as horrible as the economics and healthcare crisis are, um, if you can look out two or three years, if you can manage to find a way through the crisis, um, I think there is great opportunity on the other side. And in a way, Xbox was that way. We had to get through the crisis of that first version of the product to get to the other side. Uh, and when we were able to do that, um, uh, the other side was filled with opportunity. That's great to hear. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about the Xbox book you wrote and how, sure. how did that came to, to be a final product and what exactly do you got there? So when I, when I left Microsoft, I, I left to do, go do this nonprofit work, which I, I'm really passionate about and, and really enjoy. But I also sort of re-engaged in civics and got more engaged in what was going on in my community and in the country. And I got really frustrated. And one of the things I learned in my Xbox uh, journey was the absolute importance of, of having a well thought through strategy. And so I did this crazy thing where I said, hey, King for a day, what would be the strategy for the country? You know, if you were going to write a strategy for the United States, how would you do that? Which is an, in many ways a, a crazy, ridiculous approach. And so I, I used the strategy process in Xbox that we call the 3P framework, which is a three-page document that focuses on purpose and principles and priorities. And so I wrote that, and the first version was 12 pages. And I said, okay, those are 12 really inspired pages and nobody's ever going to see them. And, and the 3P framework, which I'm, I use all the time, requires it to be three pages. And that led me to say, hey, I want to write a book about the 3P framework and why it's so important and how it can be used um, to drive strategy and to tackle difficult problems. And I want to write a, uh, something that people will read, which means it has to be a real book. And so I wrote this book called Xbox Revisited. And it is uh, the telling of the Xbox story, not from a tell-all perspective, but from a strategy perspective. And it explains how we use the 3P framework to take what was a $5 billion losing business and turn it into a multi-billion dollar profitable business. And then it goes one step further to my civic mission, which is it does in fact take the 3P framework and apply it to civic issues. And the book has a 3P framework, three page document about what we need to do in the country and how we can make the country progress. Um, so I published that in 2015. Um, and that's been, been a really, uh, it was a great experience. I learned I love to write. Um, I think it's a, it's a timely book in the sense that there's never been more important time for us to have a strategy as a country. And frankly, we've never been less strategy led than at any time probably in our history. And, you know, if I, you know, if I went back and read that book, there's things I got right in the strategy that I wrote in 2015, there's things that I got wrong. But the idea that we need a strategy is alive and well. Um, and I, I think it's super important. Um, Final thing I'll say is I, I decided I liked writing enough that I'm, I've been working on a second book, which is actually a fiction um, political thriller book, um, which ironically is actually ultimately about the same topics, but it is a fictional political thriller with characters I made up and a storyline and a plot and um, uh, really excited. I've got a full manuscript. I'm in the hunt for a um, for an agent and a publisher right now, and uh, hopefully in the next uh, year or two, you'll be able to read that too. Looking forward to that. And if if we go back to 2015, and if we try to to apply the concept of the Xbox book into today's time in 2020, which I believe or we all believe is more challenging time than 2015, how would that strategy be for the United States and hopefully the world? Well, if you, if, you, if you go back and read in the book, the place I would start is actually with principles. You know, in the 3P framework, purpose is this sort of one sentence North Star for what you want to accomplish. But principles are sort of the, the guiding rules of the road for how you work and how you get things done. 
And I think one of the challenges we have in our country is we've lost sight of some of the guiding principles for how we get things done. You know, civility has gone out the window. The idea that we can have hard, difficult, constructive debates um, and then try to come to a conclusion and, and resolve to, a, to an answer has kind of gone out the window. And so to me, the most important part of that uh, three-page document for the country that I wrote would be the discussion of principles and what matters. And so many of the issues we face, whether you're talking about immigration or racism or um, tax policy or trade or whatever, come down to the fact that we skip past the discussion of principles and go right to dogma really quickly. And if we could get political leaders to step back and say, hey, wait, let's talk a little bit about the foundation of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think we could, we could get to an answer um, in, a, in a better way. Um, you know, the, the five priorities I wrote at the time, I would say I mostly got, did a pretty good job on those. I think the one that I probably <coughs> under, under appreciate, I certainly didn't have anything on pandemics. So I, I didn't have enough, uh, enough commentary. There wasn't a pandemic preparation priority in my list of priorities. The other one that I touch on briefly in the document, but which I don't, I didn't fully appreciate. Um, I have a pretty good appreciation for the fact that there's racism in the country. I didn't appreciate, and I'm still learning to appreciate the institutionalization of that racism. And I think that is a, um, a journey I'm on to learn and understand that in a better way. Um, as, a, as a white male of, of some privilege, um, I understood intellectually the concept of racism. I grew up in the South. I know it exists in many parts of our culture. I did not appreciate how institutionalized it had become. And so that's a place where if I were rewriting that document, that's a place that would get significantly more attention today. But we, we're going to come back to this uh, racism uh, part because I, I, I personally think it's a, it's a big discussion that we all need to have. But mm. I think we have a follow up question from uh, uh, from Jamie, if he wants to go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I had written it out. I'm happy to, to say it, though. But um, but I wanted to bridge onto something that you had said. You had mentioned that now is a great time to be an entrepreneur. And, and certainly, you know, when we have upheavals and, and social anxiety, there, there are unique opportunities for change. With that in mind, with, with an understanding of how much social anxiety there is, as well as economic uncertainty and upheaval, how important or critical is it for companies, especially new companies, to focus more on the triple bottom line uh, and or just social good in general? Um, here's what I would say. Um, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a moderate, uh, I'm a social, a social liberal and a, and a fiscal conservative, let me say it that way. And so the concept of the triple bottom line has real resonance with me. But it doesn't, have, but what I would say is don't think of it as, oh, businesses should do good because they should do good. Think of it, in my mind, businesses should do good because it's good for business. And I truly believe that focusing on what's going on in your community, the social th uh, unrest and the things we're trying to deal with as a country, the reasons for businesses to focus on those and of course, it's the right thing to do at an individual level, but at the business level, it's the right thing to do for the business for the long term. I thought what the business roundtable came out with and said, you know, we are, we're not about shareholders, we're about stakeholders. I think that's dead right. And we need to be about stakeholders. And our stakeholders are not just our shareholders, they're certainly important, but they're also our employees. There are governments, there are local community. Um, you know, one of the things I'm super proud of as being a Microsoft alumni, Microsoft as a company for reasons that are historical has always been engaged in the community. Bill Gates' mom was a, um, one of the national people involved in United Way. The company raises, I don't know, something like $100 million a year, probably a little bit more now for charity from its employees. 
through an employee matching program. And they're actively engaged in the community. And I think that's part of why Microsoft's been successful. So to me, to answer your question, Jamie, really directly, I do believe that bottom line is broader than just profit. Um, but I think it's broader not because it's not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's actually good for the soul and heart of a company. And I know it's strange to talk that way, but employees care about that. And I will tell you the generation of employees, my kid's generation right now, cares about that way more than my generation did. And if you give them a choice of working for a company that has a soul or a company that makes money and has a high growth stock, they'll pick the company that has a soul. And I think that's super powerful. I'm proud of that for them. Speaking of, of country's soul, what, what do you think cooperation in, in the United States, uh, what responsibilities do they have uh, in case of uh, social injustice, uh, racial discrimination, uh, uh, sexual discrimination, and even climate change? I think, uh, again, I would say almost exactly the same thing. Um, I think those are all relevant, important, and strategic issues for companies. Again, we can make a, I can make a moral argument for why it's the right thing to do, and I would be happy to do that. But as importantly, it's the right thing to do for the company. It's the right thing to do for the employees. I mean, how can you, if you're a consumer company, let's just say you're a consumer company, you know, uh, people of color make up, depending on the definition and whatever, something like 40% of the U.S. population. How do you serve 40% of the U.S. population if 10% of your employees are of color? I, I just, I, I, I just don't, again, as a business person, again, leave aside the moral imperative for a second. As a business person, that doesn't make logical sense to me. If one of the critical elements of entrepreneurship and driving change and being innovative is new ideas, how do you get new ideas when you have the same set of people coming up with the ideas, all of whom have the same background? It just doesn't work. So not only is it the right moral thing to do, but it is an incredibly in, uh, and powerful um, business imperative. And the challenge for corporations um, is getting beyond the numbers and getting to the institutional sources of discrimination and racism. It's, you know, companies will report, well, we have this many um, people of color, we have this many people who identify as Hispanic, this many people who identify as black or African American. That's math. The real question is what are companies doing to get behind and get beyond and get dig in to the institutional sources of inequity? And that's harder. It takes more soul for a company to do that. And it takes leadership to say, we're not just going to be about the numbers, but we're actually going to think about our processes, our promotional work, our HR work, our people development work, and we're going to understand institutionally, our recruiting, we're going to understand institutionally why we haven't made more progress. Um, this is not a three-year project. Any company who wants to work on this needs to think 10 to 15 years. Because, you know, a company like Microsoft has 100 and, I don't know, 110 or 115,000 employees. Changing that culture doesn't happen overnight and changing the institutional sources of bias in the organization, that's going to take time. That's actually a very interesting angle to look at it. The fact that businesses has to do it, it's, it's, not, it's not an option or it's not luxury anymore. They just need to make that change. Well, and here's the thing that I think is um, challenging about this. Um, I think it takes at a political level in government and in business um, real leadership to make that statement. Um, you know, it's, I love that there are people agitating for change. I love that people are protesting. I love that people are pushing businesses. That's all good. Um, that is not going to drive the change. What's going to drive the change is leaders who stand up and say enough is enough. 
we're going to do something fundamentally different and we're going to be public about it. We're going to be honest about it and we're going to deal with it. And, and we're going to be persistent about it and it's going to not be a PR thing for us. It's about changing the way the culture of our organization works. Those are big words. Easy for me to say, I, I run a one person consulting firm, so it's not, not too hard. Um, but you know, if you're Satya Nadella who runs Microsoft, um, if you're Mark Zuckerberg who runs Facebook, they have a leadership obligation to drive that change. And I will, for as a person, I look at companies that I engage with and products that I use and I ask, are those leaders stepping up to that challenge or not? And I think that's going to be the metric people are going to, going to look at, as they should. Uh, we have a new question from Dave, if you would like to go first. Thanks, Mohammed, and, and thanks, Robbie, for doing this. It's been great. Um, two, like a two-pronged question. Um, obviously, you've had a, a very successful career at Microsoft. Microsoft being one of the most successful companies in history, and you worked on the product line that's obviously been extremely successful. It's been around for decades. If you could pinpoint like one or two things that set you up for success, or you thought that differentiated yourself to excel at Microsoft. Um, I would love to hear that. And then going off of that, um, knowing what you know today, um, what would you go back and tell your 20 or, or 30 year old self or, or, or what do you tell your, your son? I think it's a good question. Tim Ferriss always asks on his podcast, but I always find it pretty intriguing about some of the answers. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the things that differentiated me from Microsoft, I was a, I joined at a time when Microsoft had just started hiring MBAs. And Microsoft, when I joined, I was, I don't know, employee 3,607 or something like that. And when I joined, Microsoft hired people based on their technical aptitude and their IQ. And I, I literally almost think about it that way. The interview process was, are they a good technical person and are they smart? Um, and because I was in one of the first classes of MBAs that Microsoft hired, I got a pass on the technical side and I have zero technical skill, um, like none. And so I got a little bit of a pass on that, but I think I was kind of fortunate to get, to get past the IQ test. And I think the reason I got past that and the reason I was still able to be successful at an early Microsoft um, is I, I have really good communication skills. Um, I love interacting and engaging with people. Um, and I'm a problem solver and I work my ass off. And, you know, that's just sort of the way I was built. Um, and, you know, inside Microsoft, that got me respect. The fact that I could talk to people was innovative and different. There wasn't a lot of that at the company at the time. Um, people respected the fact that I worked hard and that I was really competitive. Um, and ultimately, you know, when I left the company some 20 years later, the number one thing people say about me was that they respected the way I worked. And if you can, if you can go to a company and generate respect, forget whether you're successful or make mistakes. And I did, I made plenty of mistakes and did plenty of things wrong. If you can walk away saying people respected me at the company, that's a milestone. That to me is a, is a major sign of success. Um, so, you know, I, I think I worked in a way in which people walked, walked away from interacting with me saying, hey, I respected his ideas. I respected the way he appreciated me. We had a good conversation. I might agree or disagree with him, but that was a good experience. Um, what would I tell my 20 to 30 some self? Um, here's the most important lesson I learned at my, well, two lessons I learned at Microsoft that I think are most important. The first is that all those organizational behavior and cultural classes you take at, at business schools, they actually matter. Um, they're not just classes you want to get through. Culture is everything. Organizations that start, even small ones, the CEO, the head of the organization, the founders have to think about culture. Really, really important. It is a force multiplier in an organization. 
It affects organizational health. It affects mental health for the employees. It's critical. And the companies that are surviving COVID and the racial tensions and the other things we're going through are companies that have strong, healthy cultures. So that's one thing. The second thing I would tell myself is uh, work-life balance is your problem, not the company's problem. If you're working too hard and not paying enough attention to your personal life and not spending enough time with your kids and your family and your wife, that's your problem. And you're in control of it and you need to fix it. And you know, I had to, I was fortunate. I'm, I've been married to my wife. This will celebrate our 35th anniversary this year. But we had, you know, the Xbox project created a lot of personal tension. And I was not managing it well. And I had to learn the hard way to figure out how to step back, how to delegate to other people, how to let go of things, and how to decide that my personal life was more important than my professional life. Um, and I learned that the hard way. I wish somebody had yelled at me when I was 27 or 28 and, and taught me the easy way to learn that. But I'm not sure I would have listened, to be honest. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm probably too competitive to have, uh, to have listened very well. But anyway, it's a, it's a really good question. And that's sort of some reflections based on uh, a little bit of hindsight and a little bit of distance from the immediacy of uh, what I went through. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I want to talk about a, a little bit about uh, remote working and how, how do you think the culture of, of the peasant's office and how would people after COVID be actually working? We see Twitter is saying their employees can can work from home even after COVID if they want to? Yeah, I think this goes back to what I said a little bit about culture. I think the companies that have been able to adapt to a remote environment successfully are companies that actually had a strong culture beforehand. And that culture has helped them overcome the communications barriers and the awkwardness and the challenges that come um, from working in, in that kind of environment. Um, and so I think strong culture actually in a remote working environment is even more important than it is when you're physically together. Um, the second thing I would say is, I think we will end up someplace in between. Um, I don't think the lesson, um, you know, Twitter decisions aside, I don't think the lesson from COVID is, hey, everybody can work from home if they want to. I just actually don't, I don't, I don't actually think that's good for people. Honestly, I don't actually think it's good for business. And I don't think it's good for people personally. Um, what I do think we've learned is that coming to work, you know, 40 to 50 hours a week and having to be in the office for all 40 to 50 hours a week is probably not required and also probably not healthy. And that what you're going to find is companies that have more flexibility and figure out processes for employees to be able to say, hey, I'm going to be in the office four days a week, or I'm going to be in the office five days a week this week and three days next week. And we're going to, people are going to figure out how to deal with that environment and how to structure that in a way that works for the culture of the organization, but that gives people more flexibility in their personal and, and professional lives. Um, I imagine what COVID would have been like 10 years ago and what a disaster that would have been and what an economic cataclysm, as bad as this economy has been, what an economic cataclysm it would have been 10 years ago without the technology we have today. And so I think people are gonna learn some things about how to take advantage of that. Um, I'll give you one real quick example of all of what I just said. I, I'm on the board of directors for Sonos, which is a really cool Wi-Fi speaker company. It's now a public company. I joined the board 10 years ago when it was a private company. And about uh, a couple of years ago, Sonos was based in Santa Barbara, and they had sort of the twin effects of rain and a giant washout that wiped out a good portion of the city and wiped out a bunch of employees' homes, and then devastating smoke and fires. And they literally had to shut down all of their facilities in Santa Barbara. And the company already had about half of its employees in Boston, so they were on Zoom most of the time anyway. And the company went virtual in that crisis and did it successfully. And when COVID hit, while it was not easy, 
they have gone virtual again and now done it on a national basis. They have a big office in Seattle, one in Boston, one in Santa Barbara. They have people in the Bay Area. And they are, you know, essentially 100% virtual. I think almost nobody's been in an office for, for four or five months. And while business has been up and down for the company, just because retail stores got closed, et cetera, as an organization, they've na uh, successfully navigated that. And my guess is when they go back to work, they'll go back into the office because people like to socialize. They like to be around other people, but they'll continue with a lot of their virtual work. And um, there'll be a new normal about what that means. Uh, do you also have some thought about uh, the future of education and remote learning and how it's going to go after COVID? Yeah, and that's a really good question. Um, I'm not an educator by training, and I'm certainly not an education administrator by training. I think what we are learning is that there are certain forms of of learning that absolutely can happen remotely. Um, there are certain subject matters and certain training that, you know, doing it remote on a Zoom call or a WebEx or whatever technology you use, or on some kind of video presentation, where that can actually be quite effective. Um, I think there's also some um, virtual technology that's coming along that's gonna enable that to get even better where not only are you gonna be able to see somebody doing something, but you're gonna be able to virtually do it yourself. And so I think about advanced job training, I think about physical skills training, I think about where are the next generation, this is a sc scary problem we have, where the next generation of welders, construction people, and plumbers are gonna come from and electricians. It turns out in those trades, everybody is old. And how we're gonna train those people, I think a lot of that can happen uh, virtually. Um, so I think there are elements of our education system that can go online. Having said that, I can tell you in K through 12, online education is really hard. It's really difficult. Um, online education takes discipline. It takes commitment. It takes an engagement level that some K through 12 kids have, but frankly, most don't. And that's not a knock on them. It's just a developmental where they are in their personal development phase. We are losing kids right now. I'm on the national board for Boys and Girls Clubs of America and, and also on our local board. What's happening in our public schools right now is really tragic. And it, I'm not gonna get into the political debate about whether schools should open or sc schools can't open because there's a healthcare crisis. So that, that's a hard problem. But the reality is regardless of what tax schools take, we're gonna have about six months to 12 months where kids aren't gonna get properly educated. That's just almost a fact in my mind. And unfortunately, it's gonna be disproportionately kids who don't have means and or whose parents are essential workers, first responders, or uh, two income families where there isn't somebody at home. That will have an economic toll and a social toll for a while. Um, and I just don't think there's, I, you know, there's lots to try to mitigate that. It's a hard, it's a really, really, really difficult problem. So I'm a, summarizing all that, I'm a fan of online learning. I think there's a lot of good uses. It's like every other technology. It doesn't solve everything. You got to be very precise about what it does. You got to pick the things where you can prove it works. And then you got to take the things where it doesn't work and say, okay, what's the alternative and find a better alternative. Um, Boys and Girls Club of America right now has lots of kids doing virtual club experiences. And they are right now trying to validate which ones of those virtual club experiences work and which ones of them don't. And the ones that work, they will continue and, and be able to grow virtually without needing physical facilities. And the ones that don't work, they'll stop doing. And they'll have in-club experiences that fill that gap. And I think that's the way our education system is going to have to move. Uh, I think I've, we have a follow-up on that from Andrew. Uh, yes, my, my concern with uh, the virtual uh, education is the digital divide. Mm. And it, it's a serious problem. You talked about losing people. We're going to lose a lot of people. I 100% I agree with you. Um, and it's, it's a virtual divide on a lot of different parameters. So there's a, 
uh, uh, socioeconomic divide for sure. No question about that. It actually turns out to be an urban-rural divide as well, um, which is, uh, is a, another problem. And there's also a problem of just a um, oversight divide. I don't know how to quite to describe this. But even kids who have the technology or have the access, if there isn't somebody there saying, are you in your class, they're not in their class. And that's not a knock on kids. Kids are just being kids. You know, you had to be told to go to school when you were in second grade. Um, nobody voluntarily, at least I didn't, voluntarily run to school excited about doing it. And so you have all of those things going on. There was a, uh, a school uh, call for national uh, school districts, uh, an association of school districts. And this is, I'm getting this secondhand. But one of the largest school districts in the country was pointing out that they have just lost kids. There's a group of kids who they don't know where they went, and it's tens of thousands. And they were registered in the school district one day, and the school district cannot find them today. Um, so to your point, Andrew, that's a that's a disaster. Uh, and and uh, and I don't know. I don't have the right answer. I don't know that anybody has one answer. I know this that the make it up as we go along answer and have everybody guess and have every school district guess differently isn't a good answer. And um, that's, a, that's the place where our country is right now and to our earlier discussion about country. Let, leave politics aside, Let's just talk about state of affairs. Um, Making it up individually as we go along, county by county, school district by school district, leader by leader, is not a recipe for success. It's just not. And you know, we we have to we have to get do something to get past that. I, I think it it does really need a a very strong leadership in order to get through all of this. Yeah, it's um, this is so we could have a very nice discussion about national politics and leadership. Set that all aside for a second. Look, if we really want these problems to be solved, at least in the form of government and civics, the way our country operates, you need great leaders as mayors. You need great leaders as uh, city councilmen and women. You need great leaders as state legislators. And you need great governors. And we can, we can have a long debate about who should be president and who should be congressmen and women and who should be senators and how that's going to play out. It's super interesting. I'm very involved in that. I care about it a lot. But the thing I care about most is what happens in our local communities. I wrote a, a blog post last week, which is on LinkedIn. And the most important thing that needs to happen in the next six months is every American needs to vote. So go look up the blog post and forward it to everybody. And I can get it to Michael or to Muhammad. You can forward it. Um, forward it to everybody. It's nonpartisan. I'm not a Republican or Democrat. I'm an independent. I don't care about parties. Um, everybody has to vote. And it's not even that I care about who votes for the national election. It's that I care about who you vote for locally. If you want your police force to be managed differently, the president isn't doing that. That's your city council, it's your mayor, or you elected your sheriff yourself. And that's a, a problem in our country that we just have to get past. When 30% when of the people show up for a local election, we have a problem. Sorry, political soapbox, I'll get off it now, but it's, um, it's super important to me and, and meaningful. Uh Shifting gears, we, we do have a question from Igor about uh, your time at Microsoft. Sure. Sorry about that. I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, you've obviously had a, a lot of different accomplishments, and Xbox is wildly successful. But what, is, what, did, what would you say is your single proudest moment at the company? And it doesn't have to be Xbox related, but just in general. That's a good question. Um... That's a good question. I, I don't think th there isn't an achievement at the company that I'm particularly proud of. 
So there isn't like a business accomplishment or something we did that we're, I'm particularly proud of. I will pick this moment, and I mentioned this earlier, but it's really real for me. Um, you know, when I, when I was going to airports and traveling, um, inevitably you live in, in Seattle, you go to the airport, I run into people who used to work in my group at Microsoft. And somebody would come up to me and say, you know, there were 9,000 people who worked for me when I left. So it's a meaningful number of people. And somebody will walk up to me in the airport and say, hey, Robbie, good to see you. You may or may not remember me. My name is Frank or Jane or whatever it is. And we'll say hello. And then they'll say, um, and I just want to say, really respected the way you led the team. That to me is the thing I'm most proud of is when people say that to me. Um, doesn't mean they liked me. Doesn't mean they always thought I was doing the right thing. I wasn't their friend. Most of these people I never met. Um, but the fact that there was respect um, to me is, um, is cool. It's cool. Um, I will tell you that the other, probably the coolest thing I got to do and the most fun I had was being on stage at E3, which is the video game brouhaha show in Los Angeles, or at least it used to be. And in the, I think it's the 2003 or 2004 E3, we had on stage, Electronic Arts was announcing they were gonna support Xbox Live. And we had on stage every cover athlete from all of their sports. It was like 15 athletes. And then the last reveal was Muhammad Ali coming on stage. Um, and I got to spend a few minutes with him backstage. I have a, fa a picture of him that he posed of me punching him in the face. Um, and you know, this is a point in his life when he couldn't speak. Um, so everything was with hand gestures and he, he literally grabbed my hand and brought it to his face and waved the photographer over to take the picture. Um, you know, just uh, uh, as a human interest moment, uh, really impactful from somebody who um, lived an amazing, amazing life. Uh, well, sadly, we're, we're almost out of time. So um, just one final question. Uh, you spoke a lot about the 3P system of uh, purpose, uh, priorities, and uh, principles. Yeah. How, how do you apply that in your own life? Yeah, so <laughs> it's, I'm glad you asked that question. So I am, um, you may not have, you probably have figured this out. I'm, I've become a reasonably disciplined person. And so I have a 3P framework for my personal life. And I have a purpose statement for what I do. My purpose statement is uh, to communicate and inspire an army of civic engineers. That's my life's mission. I want to inspire groups of people to get engaged in their communities and to make their communities better. And so that's my purpose statement. I have a set of five principles that are both about my family, my personal life, and my work life. And then I have a set of five priorities. It's all on one page. I keep it in my desk drawer. Um, and I pull it out about every two or three months and I look at it and I say, how am I doing? And every year I rewrite the priorities based on new circumstances and what's going on. And while it sounds, um, very nerdy, um, it is incredibly powerful. It keeps me centered. It forces me in a world in which I have less structure than most people because I don't have a corporate job. Um, but I work really hard and I'm striving deeply in my life for impact. And this is a way for me to assure I'm maximizing my impact. And whether you're in the civic space or in the corporate space or in the nonprofit space or the government space or whatever space you're in, we should probably all at some level be about having impact. And that one page document um, really keeps me centered. Every once in a while I look at it and I go, oh my gosh, that's a priority. I haven't done anything on that. And it helps me to get back in, in, in the right space. So anyway, very nerdy, sounds very goofy, 
um, incredibly helpful. Actually, I'm probably going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> If, 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 if folks are interested, if you go to my website, if you go to RobbieBach.com, um, there's a little 3P link. You can read a little bit about the strategy. Obviously, you can read the book if you'd like, but you can just read the, the brief description of the strategy. It's stupidly obvious. There's nothing intellectually brilliant about it. There will be no scholarly research done on it. Um, and yet, I think it's a very practical and effective way to, to tackle problems. Well, thank you very much. It, it's really a shame we only have an hour to speak with you, but thanks a lot for everything. It, it has been a wonderful chat and everyone has learned a lot about your from your experience. So thank you very much. I'll send it back to Michael now. Great. And Mohammed, thank you for doing this. I mean, yeah. when you were making the comment about the fact that we have this crisis at this moment with pretty good bandwidth, the fact that Mohammed is we're outside of Cairo and you're in Seattle and we got folks that are joining. Um, there are some things that are working well in this, in this crazy time. And I think these kind of sessions are one of them. So Mohammed, thank you for moderating. With you. And another, um, as that comes full circle and when we first met, when your son was in the car, my son is on this call and I texted him to say uh, what he thought of this. And he's like, it's interesting. So <laughs> Goldberg be a freshman in high school test if, if he called it interesting because he and I don't often find circles of joint interest so well, to, your, to your son to your son I will say when my son who I'm very proud of and who's 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 doing quite well and off to a good start in his life when he was a freshman in high school I think I got about six words a week out of him <laughs> um, so the fact that you and your son are conversing as much as you are is a uh, is a really good thing my, my son sort of went through a period where um, you know, we didn't get a lot of verbalization, and then suddenly his sophomore year, he became uh, a person again and went on to do great things. So uh, um, kudos to your son for uh, being able to, to navigate that challenging time in life. Very good. Awesome. And Michael, I, let me just finish by thanking you for inviting me. Like, I, I love doing this kind of stuff. It's um, – and Muhammad, thank you for, for – we had a nice little conversation uh, privately and a, a really good job moderating this. Um, if there's things I can do, let me know. Um, uh, I'm excited about the work that all of you are doing and uh, hope you'll be engaged in your communities and, and make some positive progress for us and stay safe and stay healthy and, uh, and help others around you.